many of you know that uh, from the beginning of the inception of the school, which was only a few years back, the idea of uh, comparative and international has been kind of the spine of the school, both in terms of recruiting faculty with different expertise, but also in context of the programs and the courses. I wish we could say we had a track record of 20 years, but we didn't. Uh, so, uh, in terms of enhancing our expertise as faculty, because we also come with it's true rich baggages, but also limited in our knowledge. So one of the things we have been doing over the last couple of years is uh, supporting uh, international ex knowledge experiences for faculty, in addition to providing opportunities for students in context of international experiences. I hope we reach the day one day where every student has at least one opportunity to go and participate in an international forum to feel that they are indeed part of a large community. If we had 20 faculty members, our experience would be <laughs> very rich. But because we are few faculty members, involvement with the international experiences, therefore, is an intentional way of expanding faculty expertise and student uh, expertise or knowledge. So today, I'm privileged to introduce two of our colleagues. Uh, I have their CVs here with me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> each of you have had a very rich life, and so have they. So at this juncture in their life, I can tell you that uh, Jennifer, for example, got her BA in theater, believe it or not, communication <laughs> studies, uh, her MA in uh, student affairs and higher education, and her PhD in education policy and evaluation. She's had a number of teaching experiences, starting with the most junior, guest lecturer, instructor at the University of Kentucky, uh, adjunct graduate faculty at the University of Kentucky, and assistant professor at the American University in Cairo. Uh, most recently, as some of you, I think all of you know, she is dean of students. Uh, other administrative experiences have been, she was the accreditation project director at the University of Kentucky and the director of experiential education at Asbury University and the coordinator of service learning at, uh, at Asbury University. It's in Kentucky also. Okay, I saw KY, Kentucky. When I first met Jennifer at the airport for the interview, I said, where are you living? <laughs> what? There's nothing there. Well, she said, no, no, it's better when you go further <laughs> from the airport. This is not in the city. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other juicy side of life. Uh, she has been involved in various conferences and has contributed uh, extensively and uh, uh, has contributed to our program, but very quickly moved on to administration. And she's trying to straddle both. We'll see how that goes. I'm sure it will go well. On the other hand, we've had Nagra Mugahit, who has a, had a very different uh, career. She started at the Women's College of Arts and Science, where she got her BA and her MA, and then went on to Pittsburgh and got her PhD. Starting again from the very junior roles she has had, she started as an instructor uh, at Women's College, then assistant lecturer, then she worked in the Institute for International Studies in Education, University of Pittsburgh, where she was working on her PhD. Then, uh, Program Specialist for Action and Decision-Oriented Research, Faculties of Education Reform Division, and Specialist for School Quality Assurance and Accreditation. Uh, and then she worked on the USA, the funded project, Technical Advisor. Then she was a Fulbright Scholar in the University of Missouri. Assistant professor at the Women's College, then gradually joined the Graduate School of Education initially with the Middle East Institute and then as an uh, seconded, means we're borrowing her from the Women's <laughs> College. So uh, uh, we have been working together trying to formulate the Graduate School of Education, and one of the enrichment experiences for them was to go to the University of Hong Kong last year because I really believe that understanding and learning about Asia 
is in the future a very critical uh, strategy, and we need to learn more. So this was a, a, a chance for an introduction for them, and today I'm giving them the floor to share what they have, uh, what they would like to address in terms of their experience. I do have the title of their presentation. I am wrong on paper. Uh, what's the title? I'm sure you have it. Oh, yes, that's the brochure. It's called Knowledge Exchange and Institutional Identity through the lens of Hong Kong University. They spent the whole month there. It, I'm sure it was a fantastic experience. So I'll leave the floor to them so we can learn from them or listen to their experiences to enhance ours. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, to refer to the characteristics of a higher education institution that distinguished it from other institutions worldwide and they enable it to attract the best national and the international faculty and the students. It is the common discourse expressed by the institution's administration, faculty, staff, and the students when they describe it and they take pride of their belonging to it. And I can tell you that while being in Hong Kong University, everyone we have run into would speak highly of their belonging to the institutions and take pride of being there, even if we could personally observe the things in practice that contradict the discourse that is dominated. That experience. And we'll talk about that throughout this presentation. Yeah. The knowledge exchange. <laughs> um, there are many definitions of knowledge exchange. Uh, most are limited to the exchange of international scholars and faculty trading places uh, or students going abroad. Uh, but we wanted to take this in this presentation in form of going to broaden this concept of a knowledge exchange because it's actually happening all the time. It's happening between teachers and students in the classroom. It's happening between students and students in the classroom. It's also happening uh, between the student and the community, and the community and the student. And especially, there's a large focus on experiential education uh, that was highlighted at Hong Kong, at the University of Hong Kong. And so today, we're going to discuss knowledge exchanges within the framework and identity of Hong Kong through what's listed above in the slides. Uh, including, so, of course, uh, including, of course, uh, research, which is at the core of knowledge production and knowledge exchange. Mm -hmm. So one of the interesting pieces was learning about just higher education institutions in Hong Kong. And you'll see that here are um, eight, seven of them listed. Uh, Hong Kong University is the oldest of eight UGC-funded institutions. There are seven universities. And then there is the Institute of Education, which is a merger of six institutions strictly for teacher training. Uh, these are higher education institutions that are funded by the University Grants Committee. This is a, um, they're also self-funded and private and public universities in Hong Kong. But these eight that are part of this UGC-funded institutions are the highest caliber, and they're the most elite in Hong Kong. So what is the University Grants Committee? It's the advisory committee responsible for advising the government of Hong Kong on the development and funding needs of higher education institutions within Hong Kong. And as Dr. Nagel will talk about the research, the, the funding is not small for every one of these institutions. Um, the UGC is responsible for determining the funding of the government subsidized academic degree programs. And all of these institutions are considered public institutions. Um, University of Hong Kong began in 1912, so it is the oldest. It's only older than AUC by seven years. Um, and the next university that's recognized began in 1937. So Hong Kong University, or the University of Hong Kong, is the highest in the hierarchy of institutions in Hong Kong. And just a, a few quick things. Uh, Roland Chin, who was the provost vice chair, uh, describes Hong Kong University as approximately 70% local and 30% international. So, and out of the international, 10% are degree seeking, 10% are from mainland China, which we'll revisit, and then 10% are study abroad. What's interesting is there is an international student incentive that the Hong Kong government is very supportive of international students. So if a student is awarded a degree from a Hong Kong university, they can stay 12 months visa free in Hong Kong to find a job. There's also no, um, according to Dr. Chin, there's no unemployment in Hong Kong, so it's a good place to be. And the graduation employment rate from the graduates of Hong Kong University is close to 99%. Um, so English is the main medium of instruction, and the University Senate is interesting because they've endorsed English as the lingua franca. It is the tool of trade, so it is what's spoken uh, on the university. But in, 19, in 1912, 100 years later, in 2012, at their um, centennial celebration, it was decided that local students were required to take both English and Chinese language courses. Um, however, students who are native speakers of other languages uh, and who have not studied the Chinese language in their secondary curriculum can take an elective course. Yeah, and as a continuation of um, Hong Kong and university status, uh, Hong Kong uh, is actually providing a higher 
Gegenteil, uh, in the world with ranking, US world with ranking, as we can see on the screen, uh, these three uh, universities are among the top 50 universities worldwide. Uh, however, the eight institutions that we talked about earlier uh, are also among the top universities worldwide. Um, through the history of uh, uh, Hong Kong and their centennial uh, celebration, we would just uh, highlight that the university today includes 10 faculties, uh, all of which offer undergraduate and postgraduate programs. Uh, the language of instruction is English, uh, and of course uh, they do have faculty of education, which we will talk about a little bit more. Uh, back to the discourse and the institutional uh, identity, I would just uh, share with you a few words that the uh, staff, personnel, and administrators would use uh, talking about the uh, Hong Kong University. So they would say uh, it is uh, the Asia's leading international university. We admit the best students. We create a campus of diversity and the international group. We deliver quality teaching. We excel in research. So this is how they see themselves. Um, a continuation of that, uh, just to give you an overview about Hong Kong University, uh, we'll give you a few numbers. Uh, the total number uh, of uh, new intakes uh, for 2012 13 uh, almost uh, reached uh, 13,000, in which, for our gender my pleasure, uh, <laughs> gender gap is in favor of uh, female, as we can, we can see. Uh, international uh, students, and this is um, for all programs, uh, both graduate at the university and undergraduate. Uh, international students uh, constitute uh, 37 percent of total uh, students. Total number of students enrolled in, in all programs, not just the uh, new intake, as you can see, uh, 27 uh, thousands. Uh, and I would just add, uh, in terms of uh, total number of faculty and staff is almost 7,000 in which it's almost 50-50 between faculty and academic and research support uh, staff, but also technical and administrative staff, divided 50-50. While we were there, they talked a lot and they were very proud of their new uh, curriculum that they just developed, um, and among that is a, a common core curriculum. So the reason for the new curriculum was basically due to a structure reform of secondary education that reduced the total number of school years from six to five years. And this might sound familiar to some of you in relation to the Egyptian experience. Uh, Hong Kong University embarked on a reform of its undergraduate education academic structure that is described as a once in a lifetime exercise for the Hong Kong University. So they reviewed the whole undergrad program. <clears throat> this include, uh, included offering four years academic program instead of three years, since there was a reduction in the number of secondary education uh, years program. Um, they added this year for the higher education at Hong Kong University, which gave them the advantage of offering this core common uh, curriculum. Uh, the uh, um, core curriculum was bar partly implemented uh, in 2010, uh, so they uh, included the participation of uh, existing students in, in some of the courses that offered in this uh, new core curriculum, uh, but fully implemented in 2012. And the areas uh, of this program uh, include uh, scientific and technological literacy. Uh, courses uh, offered uh, would include uh, cyber societies, understanding technology as global change, uh, the science of crime investigations using technology and the science of crime investigation, uh, everyday computing and the internet. Uh, also uh, humanities and I uh, chose a, a course that uh, you know, we thought you, you would like or we prefer actually, which is uh, titled Girl Power in a Men's Warning. So, and the description of the course, I would go and take it as undergrad course. <laughs> Global uh, issues uh, as an area, um, example of the courses offered in this area 
uh, youth in uh, a global world, uh, poverty, development, and the next generation, challenges for a global world, and uh, I would just add uh, the overall goal and objectives of this core curriculum is to develop uh, a global uh, citizen. So they articulate this core curriculum around the notion of global citizenship. <laughs> and finally, China culture, of course. Uh, China culture, state and society. And among the courses offered, uh, Chinese modernization and the East Asia context. Uh, Chinese house and garden, and this is uh, architecture, uh, landscape course, uh, and uh, cultural materials in China. Part of their um, core cur curriculum reform was for these four years, and it was an entire reform of the student experience. So it was curricular and co-curricular working together to have a full once-in-a-lifetime experience for their undergraduates. So what's listed above the educational aims of Hong Kong University. Uh, how that discourse is being discussed here at AUC is what does an AUC graduate look like? This is what does a university from Hong Kong um, graduate look like? So there's pursuit of the academic professional excellence in critical intellectual inquiry and lifelong learning. Tackling novel situations and ill-defined problems. Uh, critical self-reflection, greater understanding of others and upholding personal and professional ethics. Of course, the intercultural understanding of global citizenship, communication and collaboration, and leadership and advocacy for the improvement of the human condition. These are all qualities that every graduate from Hong Kong University should have. But they also define curriculum as the totality of experiences, and, and we'll be expanding a little bit more on that, that are afforded to the students to achieve these educational aims. So the co-curricular student life in Hong Kong University, they recognize, the university recognizes that there are different mechanisms for development of these educational outcomes. Some are better handled by the teaching and learning activities, such as the critical intellectual inquiry, uh, critical self-reflection, tackling the ill-defined problems, lifelong learning. Some of them are better handled in the co-curriculum, so greater understanding of others, communication, collaboration, intercultural understanding, leadership. Uh, and not that they don't happen in the one, it's just where the focus happens. And then some of these aims, because it's fairly new, um, aren't quite developed, but the co-curricular can help alongside the curricular, such as upholding personal and professional ethics. You can learn about it, you can teach about it in the classroom, but when you're on the ground in, a, in an internship or in an academic service learning project, that's when you have to practice that. Um, the, the challenges, it was interesting, I, I spent some time, um, sorry, the role of student affairs, there was a, a part of learning to integrate the formal and the informal, the co-curricula. They also really stress the ownership back to students. The university sets up the, the environment of challenge. It provides appropriate support, but it's the student's responsibility and there's the expectation of the students that they will take ownership of their participation. Um, and as we talk through the discourse of Hong Kong University, and how amazing it is and how it's talked about that way. You saw that pride in the students, and so they did take ownership because of what they were given. Um, the co-curricular and student development side also partnered with the academic units, and they have a first year experience, similar to what we have, but they also have a third year experience. The time when students are getting into their upper level courses for their um, major, for their discipline, that's when they would focus on discipline specific writing. That's when they're focusing on looking at internships and the careers that are available in those disciplines. It's, a, it's an interesting idea that they're continuing to develop uh, as they're coming up on these third year students who actually had the first year experiences. Um, and so I thought that was one that, that had not been done in um, much of the literature. They also do the academic advising and personal counseling side by side uh, under student development alongside with the academic units and professional preparation programs and of course experiential learning programs. And their most important role that they see when you, you talk with the Dean of Students and when you talk with the staff is that they create a platform that has favorable conditions where students can participate and they can be involved in what would move them along 
to achieving these educational aims. Um, they also talk, as, as Dr. Nangwa said, about the global citizenship. And so they have a global study abroad program. They are, um, they, they, they don't have a problem with international students, degree seeking. Obviously, you can get 12 month visa and a job, and there's no unemployment, and it's very uh, appealing. But they do have, uh, where they have their challenge is to live in the mainland, the students coming in from mainland China. They're only allowed to accept 10% of the student body, and uh, in 2013, they received over 12,000 applications, appropriate applications, so that's not even the ones that were, were put aside, that they had to go through to, for approximately 2,000 spots. Um, and they said that's continuing to grow and grow yearly. One of the, the services that they offer uh, with their global um, citizenship is they have language buddies. And this is to serve not only the students that are coming into Hong Kong, but also the bilingual students uh, who are native to Hong Kong. They do uh, planned experiences both on and off campus, but especially they have planned experiences off campus so students can learn Chinese on the streets as you say, with a bilingual peer who's been taught not to jump in, not to translate, not to, but to be there, you know, in case there's trouble, which I think is exciting. The other thing that Hong Kong University does is they have student, they have student ambassadors for their recruitment of international students. The university pays for the air tick airfare, they pay for per diem uh, for students to go and be ambassadors to other students, uh, which has, again, increased the applications for, for the global how study abroad. Their global citizenship program, thank you. Uh, <laughs> but their global citizenship program, there's the overseas service programs, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, that are phenomenal. Uh, they do part to have their students participate in global conventions, so the climate change conventions, the conventions that you hear about in the news, they make sure that there are students from Hong Kong University there uh, as a part of that. Uh, not as a delegation to participate, but to be there and to have the working pieces. And they also, uh, the university provides funding for student projects. But one of the pieces that's most exciting is they have an incubation process for student NGOs and social enterprises. And so, uh, you can see in this project A, uh, we had students that would come, that came and spoke to us, and they're probably two of the most exciting sessions out of the 35 that we sat in. Um, but they, they were so enthusiastic and it was amazing what they did. For Project A, they were providing access to clean water for a primary school in Cambodia. So some of our, our delegation was from Cambodia and knew this area, so, so that was neat for the students. But how they're doing this is they went and they started in um, July, and that's where they started the process for a, a trip in June. But even prior to that, this group decided what the engineering students decided they wanted to design a pump that would be sustainable, that would be made of parts that the, they could find in Cambodia, that would run in a certain length of time, uh, that would provide, that would be solar energy, and where this place was in Cambodia, there was also a lot of wind, so they were doing that. So while we were talking with the students, they were coming to the end of designing these water pumps uh, with the college, with the faculty of engineering, uh, resources. No professors were involved, no instructors were involved, they just gave students access to these labs to design these pumps. Um, so they looked at sustainability, they looked at ease of use, what does this mean, what is the impact on the culture, so psychology students were involved. They did a lot of fundraising and their fundraising brochures um, were amazing, this is just one of them. But full glossy, uh, they would have, where well, we have the booths on Bartlett Plaza, they had booths set up in huge displays uh, to raise money. So they were communication students, they were business students involved. They talked about patenting this engine um, for the pump. There was some discussion, of course, we asked questions about intellectual property, who actually owns the patent, is it the university, is it the students? Uh, there was never an answer. It's kind of, so we're, we're still not sure about that one. But it brought together students from communications, business, engineering, sociology, anthropology, psychology, and a representative from each of those disciplines went for the initial visit to see if this was a sustainable place for them to do their work. 
it was very exciting. Um, it was very needs based. And then they came back and they, to raise money for it for the trip that will happen six months later down the road. The second um, experiential education, like I said, is a very large part of, of the co-curricular and curricular experience for the students. And that, that is a separate unit um, under student development, but it works closely with the academic side. They believe in whole person education. Uh, when I spoke with the director uh, who's there, um, he was explaining that their aim is to cultivate among students the breadth of knowledge, competencies, and qualities which they can consider and themselves to be educated individuals within the community. So they had uh, the local community engagement. It was interesting. They talked about white coffins. And so that was one of the, the um, projects that they were most excited about. And white coffins are styrofoam. It was white styrofoam. There was no styrofoam to be found anywhere on the campus of Hong Kong University, in the Starbucks, in the subway, in any of the restaurants, because students started a petition and a movement and research-based and evidence-driven of what these uh, styrofoam dishes do, and they called it the white coffin canteen. Wow. I mean, it was it's very powerful, and, and they said, hey, come on over here. <laughs> but not only did they, did they say what was wrong and why we shouldn't have the styrofoam, they also designed uh, cardboard utensils that you can use. They designed cardboard dishes that were easier to use and save money. I mean, it was a phenomenal interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary project that they could work with. Um, they also locally, with community engagement, there's medical assistance, the medical school, uh, which Dr. Nagel will talk about a little bit, but a lot of undergraduate education in the pre-medical programs. They will provide medical assistance to, to local Hong Kong residents that can't have that. And they're also um, very important and insist on youth empowerment. So the other piece that, the other uh, project that students talked about was a project in Nepal, and it was the College of Art, headed up by the College of Architecture. Um, they also started their site familiarization in July. They thought that it was very important um, to have not only, they were coming to fix the physical environment of a school and an orphanage, but they didn't just want to fix the physical environment, they also wanted to provide empowerment, and they also wanted to provide involvement. So they had uh, child psychology students come along because they had the children to help. They had the engineering students come because they redesigned the playgrounds, they redesigned the classrooms. Um, but they wanted to bring hope in too. And I don't know if you can see this picture. One of the things, they did a lot of paintings. They had some of the art students come and do murals. But this one picture, the painting on the wall is how to build a paper airplane. And then they had all the kids that were involved in the project learn how to build a paper airplane. So they said, not only are we making it beautiful and changing their physical environment, but we're also empowering them to be able to create something of their own. Um, and that was something that their directors and the students came up with on their own. So it was very exciting to be a part of, to listen to what they can do and see the potential of what's out there. As a continuation of knowledge exchange and an institutional identity, uh, let's talk as well a little bit about research uh, in relation to that. But before doing so, I will try to put things a little bit in a global context. Because globally, uh, the discourse that have been dominating higher education so far is business. Economic return is always perceived as uh, the goal of higher education. And with the economy crisis that's facing the world, this became really questionable. Um, in today's world, uh, the Hong Kong University actually decided to change that discourse and they put knowledge as their main goal of higher education. Especially, and this is uh, from the perspective of uh, Lena Wong, who is the associate dean for postgraduate studies, <laughs> in his, um, his work, he uh, shared with us. Um, that the following, um, when he talked about how um, the world, in today's world, most universities graduates are not doing what they learned to do. Also, they are changing the world a lot. Credentials, depression over time is uh, happening very quickly. 
the economic uh, discourse of education is breaking down. The promise of education for economic return is questionable. Now it is a knowledge discourse including the knowledge exchange and the knowledge production. And this is exactly why research became very, very important. He added uh, economic crisis um, and uh, uh, economic crisis come and go with no concern, irresponsible politicians everywhere, military expansion, social unrest, individual and organized uh, terrorism and actions. So higher education in uh, higher education for knowledge exchange and production and growth are needed for people survival in such a world. So I think this is very powerful and high up the importance of research and the knowledge exchange that Jennifer talked about some aspects of it in relation to their uh, programs. So um, having uh, research at the core of knowledge production and uh, knowledge exchange and with the discourse that Hong Kong University used to introduce itself, um, there have been international recognition for its accomplishment as a research led comprehensive university. And I would add that the university uh, is a founding member for the 21st uh, Century Universities Network worldwide, uh, which was established in 1997. This is a leading network of research uh, university that uh, focuses on uh, research, inspiring teaching and learning. And I think this is very important, the, the connection between research to inspire teaching and learning to avoid this kind of sometimes separation between research and learning and teaching inside classrooms. But they also focus on students' mobility, uh, connecting with students and staff, and wider advocacy for internationalization. So what about the research and knowledge exchange at Hong Kong University? Focusing on creating knowledge in the first place, uh, they perceive research uh, holding the key to the future, uh, but also combining that with application of knowledge. So they focus a lot on creating knowledge and uh, applying the knowledge as well. And of course, the famous example of knowledge application, uh, which is very well known, uh, when in 2003, the Hong Kong University Medical Researchers became the first in the world to identify the coronavirus that uh, caused the uh, SARS. Um, they also view uh, research as playing a major role for the uh, university and social transformation. Uh, so it's a knowledge-based economy and social transformation for them, and this wouldn't be achieved without uh, sort of, uh, evidence-based research. Um, they articulate their work uh, in relation to collabor collaboration, innovation, uh, technology, um, and uh, international, uh, sorry, intellectual uh, cooperative rights. And as Jennifer highlighted, they are still working on their policy for intellectual rights uh, to uh, acknowledge that among staff uh, and students and faculty. Uh, <coughs> uh, for the government fund for academic research, uh, we talked a little bit about how we have uh, in Hong Kong uh, the University uh, Grant Council and the Research uh, Grant Council. According to the Under Secretary of University Grant Committee, the government of Hong Kong provides funding for academic research to the eight higher education institutions we talked about uh, through the uh, Research Grant Committee. However, this constitutes the major source of research funding for the eight institutions, making up uh, about 76% of their uh, research funding. And I, one of the interesting things for us, I think all of us that were sitting in this room when they talked about that, was that is a reduction from what the funding used to be. So the government provides 76% of all of the funding for research, and they said that's a reduction, and they were lamenting the fact that they had a cut. And I think most yeah. of us there, like, just what? So you don't understand <laughs> what it's like to have not that. So yeah, but also reflecting about the Egyptian context and how here research and fund for research is not very well recognized by the government, it's a little bit sad. Um, so um, 
the UTC provides the search support for infrastructure overheads, etc. And the total uh, amount in 2013 was 3 billion per year in Hong Kong dollars. Uh, and the funding for research programs, so this is just for infrastructure, for research programs, um, doctoral uh, fellowships, PhD fellowships, and graduate studies, uh, it's uh, one and a half billion Hong Kong dollars. Um, and interestingly enough, as part of their research strategy, which is really amazing, teaching and learning, research for innovation in teaching and learning at the top of their agenda. And they plan to direct the highest percentages of fund toward teaching and learning, innovation in teaching and learning. Um, so just since this is at the core of their uh, research uh, strategic plan, uh, we thought to also talk about faculty of education in Hong Kong and maybe highlight how there are uh, several opportunities for cooperation um, that we will elaborate further. Before doing so, this is just an example of, we talked about the total amount of fund, uh, which is uh, 3 billion and Hong Kong dollars per year, but this is what Hong Kong University and others would receive and the distribution of it in different uh, disciplines. Uh, interestingly enough, we can see how physical sciences and the humanities and social sciences are really receiving very good percentages of this fund from the government, uh, of course, biology and medicine makes sense since Hong Kong recognizes medicine as a, a discipline that they still in, 30%. And you can see the amounts in, in, in millions. Uh, engineering, 29%. Uh, business studies, 8%. Which is, I think, somehow a little bit different than how we here put a lot of emphasis on business and marketing. But they are looking at it totally from a different perspective. It's more or less from a knowledge production and exchange perspective. Um, another example, this is a theme that they uh, generated recently called Early Career Scheme, and, and it's basically to support early career, career professionals and students, and we can see how they devoted a, a lot of amount of money for this as well, and how the percentages for humanities and social science somehow increased dramatically, even in comparison to the other uh, segment. For the Faculty of Education, they do have undergraduate and postgraduate programs. They offer a highly competitive and prestigious fellowship for national and international students. And we do have a brochure displayed in the back for our graduate students who are interested to explore that. And you definitely can get more information about that through the website. Um, they do have uh, research for to cover 19 areas, including, of course, comparative education, curriculum studies, early childhood education, education in China, educational leadership and administration, educational policy, higher education policy and practice, science learning, and much, much more. 19 areas of, of interest. Uh, they do have eight research centers, and they continue to expand that. Uh, I remember a year and a half ago, they, they had six research centers. Nowadays, they do have eight research centers. And this is just important, because when we talk about our vision for future uh, possible opportunities for collaboration, we need to consider what are existing there. Uh, so among these centers are Comparative Education Research Center, Center for Educational Leadership, and Center for Information Technology and Education. And um, the data is displayed in the back. You can have uh, more information on that as well. So. And in the Faculty of Education, it's the British model. So they're not classes, they're not formal classes. Uh, every faculty member advises about 12 to 15 students uh, per year. And how it works, we asked about the, the, how you match up the research. Well, the students apply, they apply online with what they would like to pursue in their research. And if it's a good match with a faculty member, then they'll get in. And if it's not a good match, then they don't. So it's, it's a great system of being able to use the funding appropriately to continue the research that is the faculty member's focus, as well as bringing students in 
And involving that with the, the teaching and innovation. Exactly, and this is partly why we do have a lot of, besides having research centers, besides having these research interests, specific research interests, so they can attract the attention of the government and the funding that's offered and provided. We thought it was very important, after we've given you kind of how the University of Hong Kong works, uh, we, the last few sessions that we, we set um, in talked about the management of the University of Hong Kong identity, and it's a very strategic management. Uh, as you can see, this is the shield from their coat of arms, and you will see this everywhere. Uh, if you probably didn't notice, but the slide with the little boy flying a kite, the shield was in the kite. Uh, if you get a notebook, any kind of notebook or pad of paper on the university at campus, it will have on every page the shield is on it. All materials, um, all materials have the shield. This is this is the crest, and it's interesting when when they were they, they talked about it too. Of course, it's very British in look. It gives a distinction outside of Hong Kong. It's a reminder of antiquity and um, dig, uh, dignity. Uh, it's a corporate identity. But remember, the university is only 103 years old. So, but yet this gives it this, this feel of, of longevity. And the shield, like I said, is everywhere. It was talked about many times during the sessions. And on their website, there's a very long description uh, describing it. But some of it is as follows. And you can see uh, what the Latin and what the Chinese says. But it, if it's read correctly, uh, the Shield talks about the founders wanting to say something about this new university, that it's actually following a legacy and, and will become part of a legacy, that it contains allusions to both the European and the Chinese culture, and they want to express their aspirations for their university in both the European and a Chinese idiom. So, and they also see, and this was spoken of quite a bit, harmonious balance between Western and Chinese traditions, and that it's a happy mixture of the East and the West. And both phrases, of course, are extremely appropriate for the institution of higher learning. And if we go back to the educational aims, the function of the university is not simply to inculcate knowledge and to bring knowledge, but it's also to train young people how to become responsible members of society, or to use an older phrase, how to manifest virtue, uh, and how to also teach them how to investigate things, which of course is one of the main principles of scientific inquiry. So as the oldest university in Hong Kong in 103 years, there is a sense of legacy that was discussed and was felt that was not felt. We did get a site visit to Hong Kong Polytechnic. And that university was started 30 years later, but that felt like a new university that just kind of appeared with, without a legacy behind it. So it was, again, Hong Kong University um, heritage was talked about quite a bit. Um, a modern and current project that they're doing is they have a brick wall and we brought, they had a big carnival opening up this brick wall, but this is a memory wall, this is a honorarium wall, you can buy a brick, it's a fundraising yeah. uh, piece, of course, and you can see everyone that bought the first day bricks. Um, and you can buy a brick and you can have a message that's been university approved, uh, put on the brick. But it was interesting, it goes into, it's a rooftop garden that's absolutely beautiful in a very concrete jungle of Hong Kong. But the wall is built serpentine, the wall's already built and it's totally complete with all of the bricks in place. But they have, you pull out the one brick and you put in the brick that has the, that's been donated or that has the signature on it or the name. And so with, so you can come and see the bricks, but it was interesting that they had already completed the project, but now it's ready for you know the donors and fundraising yeah. to be a part of it. So that was just an interesting, uh, different way of seeing things. They, they also placed it in a very nice uh, place and area at the university, in which you can see it's at the top uh, mountain, sort of uh, uphill, and you can see different sides of the university while you are there. So that was a beautiful part of the managing the identity um, that just made a lot of sense. But we did, we'll just talk a little bit about some of the managing of the identity, and this is where a lot of our questions, uh, I think, kind of surprised them a little bit. If you can't see that, this here. is a closed uh, circuit television camera uh, sign. Those were posted everywhere. They're only about that big, though. So they're very small. You, you had to keep looking for them. 
But one of the things they talked about was state control, because of course in 1997 Hong Kong went back to the, the People's Republic of China. And it was interesting because we also had uh, people in our delegation from Macau, which also went back to China uh, to, to come under the auspices of the government. But because, according to them, uh, because Macau is such a fundraising, uh, fundraising, because it's such a money-making place, yeah, the, whole, uh, the Chinese government has not done very much with it because they want to keep the money <coughs> coming in with that. And so they said they don't feel the pressure and control so much as probably Hong Kong does. So we asked about the state control and this whole concept of academic freedom, because of course with all of this research output that's happening, uh, where does that fit in with academic freedom? But they have their own mini constitution on the books, the university does, that states, uh, that gives academic freedom for research. So while they are funded by the government, the government cannot influence the university because of the Hong Kong University Ordinance that's on the books uh, within the, the housing of the government documents. So that was talked about a lot. But then as, as time went on in our program, uh, this Occupy Central was just getting started, if you're familiar with that protest movement. And so the students wanted to have a mock elections uh, to see if they really wanted the Hong Kong consulate out. And so um, Hong Kong University agreed that they could have the mock elections on there. They said they have student protests all the time, but their students are so well behaved and the protests are so well structured that it's just part of the learning environment. That was a lot of the rhetoric that we remember. And we asked about why uh, students are protesting on campus and do not uh, in other places out of campus. And they said, in this case, we protect our students so they can protest and spread fine protesting their yeah, demand, but all, all comes. And of course, we, we in our small group discussion, talked about the gate closure here, because we talked about our own institution and, and security and, and some of those issues. Uh, but they, they claimed and, and talked quite a bit how there were no police on campus, because there was no need for any police on campus. Um, but what we found was there's a very active security staff that, that comes along and... and uh, it's not very visible, uh, and it's of course it's a green campus and they have very restricted policy against smoking, so we, I explored having security <laughs> when I was smoking, just outside the building, and it's, it, it, it was directly outside the building, but still it's, it's considered uh, on campus. Mm -hmm. um, they do have very active security. Well, and the other, and we ask, um, and so the other thing is that uh, Hong Kong, the University of Hong Kong leadership, uh, there are general administrators, there are professional administrators for area like public relations and human resources, and they general, they're trained for the position, and they might rotate into another position, or they hire ones that are already professionally trained. But while they talked about no governmental influence, at least six of the lay members of the university administration are appointed by the Hong Kong Chancellor, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Hong Kong, or the President of Hong Kong. So there's currently a gentleman's agreement that the Chancellor will talk to Hong Kong, have a conversation with the University of Hong Kong before they make any appointments. So while they say there's no government control, there are currently six people that were appointed or approved or vetted through the government. Um, and they said this may or may not continue. The other thing that I found interesting is their student union uh, is not under the university, but it's chartered under the Hong Kong government. And so they're affiliated with the government. And so student union fees, all students have to pay student union fees along with their student fees. And so the question was asked, by us, because we're dealing with these questions. Uh, you know, what happens if students, because again, this Occupy Central was starting, so if students aren't in agreement with the government, do they still have to pay the fees for the student union? And, um, you know, there was a lot of silence. It was just, well, yeah. of course, why wouldn't they? But then we kind of pushed it a little further. And they did say that students, uh, they believe students do have the choice to opt out of paying the fees, but it's quite a long process, and the students, from how they described it, we felt like, in our discussions in the evening, uh, <laughs> that the students would be marked. And of course, you don't yeah. want to be careful of that. So Catherine Ma, who was the director of the Office of Communication and Public Affairs, 
Uh, she spent a lot of time talking about how in the current environment of universities as business and the stakeholder landscape, that there's a value-added service for managing communications that enhance and safeguard the university reputation. This was one of our final sessions, and I think for me, this spoke a lot about the, in some of the aspects of this institute and how it was, how it was put together. Um, this one we also, uh, we did ask about the security and the cameras. Because in our classroom uh, that we sat in, which is about half the size of this room, there were five cameras that were watching us. And then of course, once you see those, every time you're walking down the hallway, you're standing, you're looking and finding the cameras. So I asked, uh, and they, I asked about the cameras, and I, I asked um, the director of the institute, you know, we're just in the conversation, and I said, you know, I'm interested to know what these cameras are. I assume because it's Hong Kong, they work. You know, if it was Egypt, I'm not sure that they would have worked, you know, but they were working, and I said, now these cameras that are all through this classroom, what, what's being taped? Is it, you know, um, audio and visual? Where do these tapes go? What are they for? And I think, and as we talked about later, that the, the people that were teaching us in this institute were surprised that there were cameras in the room. It's just, I think, becomes such a part of life in Hong Kong that they don't even notice that they're being taped and they're being watched. And what we did learn from Catherine Ma, the director of communication. We for that there are also cameras in the streets. So it's not only on cameras and in classrooms. But in main streets and in side streets, so we there are it. cameras <laughs> everywhere. Even when in our way back to the airport, just hitting the bridge highway, and we can see cameras everywhere. Yeah, there's cameras and, about and every day. They have signs just years. to inform you that you are monitored basically. So if you think of any type of freedom, academic or civilian freedom, it's like very questionable for us. Mm -hmm. Very questionable. So, what, what we did learn was the cameras on campus, they keep them. They use them, they go back and they stay in file, they get digitally uploaded in case there are issues. That's kind of where they, where they left yeah. it at that. So we didn't want to ask any more, more questions from there. But it was just interesting, of, you know, they talked about no police. And again, for us, I think one of the, the privileges of this institute was being able to, to be there with a colleague because we did a lot of reflection yeah. after. And what did that mean for AUC? And we'll talk about that in just a minute as we wrap up. <laughs> um, what do these things mean for AUC? And of course you don't need to have police. You don't need to have anyone waiting on the bridge to catch you speeding because you have these cameras that are always rolling. And so, but they just never really talked about that part. And so, so there are some things that, that made us a little skeptical. One of the pieces, these are the chairs we sat in. Yeah. We took pictures of our chairs. And today. may I add something in relation to that? Because we talked a lot about experiential learning, open based learning, and how they are big on that. But I will tell you that during our 14 days of this program, we spent most of our time sitting on this chair. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> one of the pieces that they asked us to do that, that was very helpful is they asked for us to have a uh, knowledge of product that each delegation leaves with the knowledge of product before they go. And that was very helpful for us bringing in the offices together and looking at what we could do. So as Nag and I, and then we presented this, so it just was about a two minute presentation um, to, the, to the delegation that we were with. And so um, the objective of our knowledge project is to begin a partnership between AUC and the Hong Kong University through the platform of experiential learning. Um, Community-based learning has long been standing tradition at AUC as both a curricular and co-curricular model. And so while students have participated in projects throughout Egypt and across the region, there's been little partnership with Asia. Asia. And as Hong Kong University's model of service learning is co-curricular, by creating a partnership that blends the models together, we can have a seamless learning environment. So it's non-academic in Hong Kong, and we just celebrated today its academic uh, community engagement. So we've changed from community-based learning, but we just had a celebration today where it's more academic. So we can provide a seamless learning environment with that. We also, when we talked with the students and when we talked with some of the faculty about some of the, the big challenges, because students will go into rural China quite a bit. That's an easy place for them to go. 
They talk, the big challenges that you see are very similar from China as they are in Egypt. Of course, it's population, it's clean water, public health issues. Um, and as Hong Kong University is moving away from exams and rote learning with their new core, and as AUC is working towards more student-centered pedagogies, we thought these challenges could become a basis for, for problem-based learning and something that we can work on together as there are similar challenges. So what do these problems look like? They talk about ill problems, you know, these wicked problems. How can we fix, look at the hot clean water issue in China? How do we look at it in Egypt? And have our students work together with that. So one project that was already discussed uh, that, we, that holds a lot of potential, and those of you that uh, know me from TSC, uh, is an interdisciplinary project for designing and implementing primary and secondary level curriculum for STEAM disciplines in the rural and low community or lower socioeconomic status schools using low to no technology uh, experiments. If you, there was a slide that had the tires uh, with strings in it. What the engineering students designed, or the architecture students designed, was they realized there were a lot of tires in this place in Nepal, so they took rope and they turn those tires into chairs. And so there's, they had pictures of ki kids just sprawling all over on this concrete floor but on these rubber chairs that gave. And so that's some of this low to no technology that, that we think it would be interesting to see how we can work that out in rural China as well as in upper Egypt. And it also is interdisciplinary. It brings all of these uh, disciplines together. And then we talked about the internationalization part. Um, it was interesting because in Hong Kong University, and I would say a lot of the, again, we were the only non-Asian besides our Afghanistan colleague, the non-Asian uh, representatives at this delegation, and they truly saw Africa as being monolithic, and of course Egypt is not a part of Africa, it's just there. Um, and I think say this information about the Middle East as a very troubling kind of region and would it be safe? I remember while presenting that the question what would be would it be safe to send our students and faculty to Egypt and, mm -hmm. uh, and the region. And so and then AUC students sometimes tend to see Asia as China, you know, and not Cambodia and Laos and Vietnam and <laughs> Myanmar and all of that. And so we thought that this was a chance or China is just one Shanghai or Beijing. And so this would give a chance for the students to interact in other parts of the world with each other. So they have that peer buddy, those language buddies. So this was just a small part. We saw this as a knowledge exchange for the research. And it would be looking with uh, initiatives with Comparative International Education, along with the Comparative Education Research Center uh, at Hong Kong University, to do some of the research for best practices and of course, as Nagla says, then informing the teaching for the community-based learning as well as the experiential education at Hong Kong University. Right. And, and so this is just one of the knowledge products. Right. And I would add in relation to the uh, research aspects, uh, the approach is, is really to relate that and connect it to strategic and cooperative research between the two institutions, uh, representing institutional partnership, and focusing on the theme of internationalization and this exchange program between the faculty and students to the two institutions, uh, we thought uh, having um, uh, the uh, graduate school of education initiatives for comparative international education in collaboration with the Hong Kong Center for Comparative Education uh, develop uh, this strategic research plan for the two institutions that would include themes and area of interest in relation to Asia uh, and, uh, and Africa uh, toward the move uh, of fulfilling the internationalization of both institutions. One a final word. Of course, you go to a place like the University of Hong Kong where they got 580 million uh, Hong Kong dollars for research. You see their facilities, you see, and it gets very discouraging. And you think, where are we? We're so far behind. We're nowhere near there. And so, but one of the pieces that was interesting, there were, there were two things. One, as far as the participants and where they were uh, in their different regions and their different countries, AUC is, is, is moving quite along, I think, in a good way. Uh, especially the graduate school of education, what we're doing with our, with our with the students, 
what we're doing with projects, what we're doing with vision, uh, we're much farther along. Of course, there's Hong Kong University, but then we weren't down here. You know, we were up here with that. The other piece that was interesting was this concept of legacy and longevity was extremely important. Our um, colleague from Afghanistan was from the Ministry of Education. He worked at the American University in Kabul. And so, you know, he's like, where are you from? We're like the American University in Cairo. Oh, American universities, I just, they just pop up everywhere. And I, so we learned we had to say the American University in Cairo will be celebrating our centennial in 2019. We're almost, and then all of a sudden, it was like, oh, okay, you've been around. You're, you're legitimate. And so um, what yeah. part of higher, part of comparative international education in higher education is age brings legitimacy, uh, whether it should or not. It does. So we learned to say we're at, a, we're at the American University in Cairo. We've been in Cairo for you know almost 100 years. And that kind of changes from these new American universities that are popping up everywhere. And just to, to wrap it up and to connect this with the institutional identity that we talked about in the first place, definitely legacy is part of it uh, and it should be promoted. And I think uh, it's very important among the issues that uh, AUC need to consider is developing this common discourse with the acknowledgement of challenges that uh, we are all facing, whether on camps or in relation to the overall context in Egypt, national regional and international level, but I don't think we are not at the stage of having this common discourse when we talk about uh, our institutions here. In Egypt in general, I would say it's not just in this. Yeah. That's it. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, really, this is uh, it's a very rich experience. <laughs> Three weeks, once or a month? Okay, three weeks. Three weeks. Three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah. A very enriching experience about the part of the world that is very important. Uh, and for many of you who are still at the beginning of your journey, uh, uh, it will be your world, part of your world. I, I think. And in Hong Kong, uh, I worked with them, we, with uh, George Mason, Hong Kong University, and AUC to, to apply for a Temple 10 grant. Uh, we didn't get it this year, uh, but Hong Kong University is very interested in working with us and working yeah. with our students. So, so it could be our strategic mm -hmm. yeah. for the future. I want to say something about your being troublemakers. <laughs> when our students were <laughs> at, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> asking <laughs> questions, <laughs> actually it happened in front of me. When the students were at uh, Paul Fier Institute, uh -huh. Dr. Torres told the Egyptian students, Egyptian students, I don't want you to participate in this discussion. <laughs> Give others a chance. Right, right. I think this is a very rich discussion, and I think we can have some time for questions. Yeah, I, uh, we can have time for some questions. Uh, Any of uh, I was uh, thinking about the multidisciplinary uh, projects and um, I was thinking about uh, who organizes those projects uh, and I, I think also that would affect the students' grade, yeah. uh, especially when it happens uh, through the different fields like uh, engineering, um, social studies and so uh, who does that? Is the student body uh, doing this as For you said? In Hong Kong University and I will... Um I'll, I'll try to remember to send you the emails and the videos because it was amazing. Uh, we couldn't show it here. It would have taken a couple yeah. hours to show what they do, how they transform the whole campus. Uh, it's stu all student-led and student-run. It's all co-curricular. Also, they do have one curriculum committee at the university level in which work on planning and organizing that. So it's not happening randomly. Of course, students are encouraged to take initiatives and implement but um, and the director they explained how they do have this curriculum curriculum committee that actually uh, has been working before the full implementation of the core curriculum for mm -hmm. about three years, three academic years, and they come up with the plan of virtual implementation, then the full implementation. And then with the, the service learning projects and the experiential experiential <coughs> education, everyone on the director level in the student development office or student affairs office, CEDARS is what it's called, uh, all have their PhDs. 
So there is a, there is a, a natural and organic link between academic and co-curricular because of the PhD uh, experience. Some in psychology, some in engineering, and some. So, so for the experiential education, if that's like the trips to Nepal and the architecture and all that, it started by usually students within one faculty. Well, it was eight students for the, the engines. And to hear these students, you know, we, we talked about sitting in the chairs and, and you know, non-students aren't, they might be passionate about what they do, but they won't show it. Um, these students came in and especially if they had parts of their engines, they were showing us what they were doing, they were explaining things that were so technical. And but it was that you couldn't recognize that the, the oldest person joining them, who looked also young, is actually their instructor. And they do have big percentages of uh, and research faculty, and, and, and faculty will come on, right. on board. You know, they'll have a yeah. faculty advisor that, that, that students <laughs> decide. So. But it's, it's mainly run by students. Okay, great. Um, I'm sorry to pop in another question. No. Uh, you mentioned that, that there are some research of interests. Uh, how this would be aligned with the uh, National Strategic Plan? Because it's a national university, as I understood. Um, so the research topics and the National Strategic Plan, uh, would that they, they have been they aligned by any means or not? Because I can see that they are helping uh, their country to grow. Yeah, they are definitely aligned, and this is why when we look at the structure from at that national level, we do have the University Grants Committee, and then we do have the Research uh, Grants Council, but beneath that you would have Individual Research Committee, and this is for individual research interests, and they allocate as well a huge percentage of funds for that. There is another collaborative research committee. Interestingly enough, they do have the Students uh, Research Committee, which of course include graduate and undergrad students, and they would allocate funds for that as well. So they manage it in a way that would maintain the autonomy of the university in relation to uh, different type of proposals, whether it would serve the national interest and the interest of the government, which is possible and needed, I would say, uh, universities are not working in a vacuum, or if it's individual interest that would serve, I would say, the globe, like the, 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 the School of Medicine case. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the structure the governance, if you will, uh, whether for the research funding scheme or other, um, like the co-curriculum, would maintain the flexible implementation and the engagement, so part participation of different partners in this case. And it was interesting, the Faculty of Medicine there, um, having worked at universities that have medical schools, this, we got to meet with the dean, he's the youngest dean uh, that they have, he's 41. Uh, he's also, yeah. besides being dean of the Faculty of Medicine, he's also the conductor for the Hong Kong Symphony. I mean, he's modern, very impressive, very, so. very, impressive and very um, eclectic, you know, multidisciplinary yeah. in himself. But one of the things that, that the medical school does is they also send out uh, their research is also part of service, so and part of the global piece. And so a lot of the, the aims, the educational aims, even in medicine, they're talking about uh, making sure that the medical students have a global experience, that they do something to serve. Uh, and so when we said we were from Egypt right away, he said, oh, we have a group that are out somewhere in Upper Egypt working with the camels because we believe that the camels yeah. can find, yeah. there's uh, something in the blood of camels they were for H1N1. Yeah, the kind of disease that yeah. uh, one would think. And so they're working on that to see how that might help with it. But it also, he talked about the giving the medical students a global experience of being in Egypt. And so I, I would add, I think the big advantage of what they are doing is they are highly documenting every single thing. In a very high quality manner. As you can see from the manner. YouTube video that was. So it's with like visual documentation or published kinds of documentation, but they are very good at doing that, which gives them very easy access kind of for recognition. So international recognition is very accessible because they are also transparent. So you can get information about their budget, the allocations of their budget at the university level, the source of income, um, everything. It's just you know during the maybe the uh, the the break or whatever after the session, you can look at the materials and it's really interesting how everything is published. And everything is bilingual. So and you see all the posters are in Chinese and, and English. English. I think this might explain the camera. Mm -hmm.
<laughs> this might explain the camera. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe one more question. Well, we'll take the student so questions so first. Go ahead. Dr. Hibben, Dr. Stacey. I was just wondering to what extent sustainability, you mentioned the styrofoam cups and the initiatives in Holland and Cambodia. To what extent is mainstream into the core curriculum, which you said that they need to be updated? So to what extent is it um, part of, of the basic? We have one of our sessions was with the sustainability officer mm -hmm. who actually is uh, very good friends with our president and her husband. Uh, graduate of Columbia, and so sustainability is a piece of the the university environment. It's, it's just it was a natural, of course, that we would talk about it because that's what we talk about all the time. So it's not uh, it's not compartmentalized. It's been mainstreamed in. One of the questions that we asked again, uh, and coming from Egypt, and it was last summer, the power outages that were happening, you know, six, seven, eight times uh, a day. You know, these buildings are 150 stories Hong Kong, high yeah. in Hong Kong. And the elevators, it's all elevators. So we, we did ask, part of the sustainability yes. of electricity, and, and she, I mean, what they're doing to find alternative fuel, um, uh, alternative fuels, but the generators and stuff. But when we did ask about the elevators, just kind of as a, as a joke, because, you know, I my little elevator yeah. here when the power goes off, so, and they just said the power never goes off. Yeah. And I thought, okay, I mean, you know, as you're on heading up to the 80th floor. Uh, but the sustainability was, is very much just in roll, is rolled into the life of the university. We have another question. Okay, the last one. Yeah, the last one. Um, Dr. Nagel, you mentioned um, about how uh, the credential depression and return on, on education and all this. And I'm just wondering because mainland China has a lot of uh, rural urban migration, like Egypt, mm -hmm. and a part of this is for work and for education. So is it part of their institutional identity over there? Do they take into account the cultural diversity? Or is there, <coughs> what I've read in previous um, courses, that there is a stigmatization they have there, like here, about the difference between rural and urban populations, and whether this is uh, taken into account something similar to the LEAD project here or the LEAD scholarship. Mm -hmm. um, that and other kinds of diversity, like special needs or uh, you know this kind of yeah. thing, is it part of the yeah. picture? Thanks for your question. It's an excellent question. Well, I will answer in two ways. First, at the level of Hong Kong University, they are definitely taking this into consideration. One of the research uh, interests focusing on students with special needs and all of these uh, issues. And of course, as I mentioned, poverty and development is one of the common core courses that are offered. So at the level of Hong Kong University, yes, definitely this is uh, taken into consideration. It's highly emphasized. They are actually taking the pride of having international students, of having the fund for students from uh, lower socioeconomic backgrounds, but they should have got to gain a high score and maintain uh, what is required to enter Hong Kong University. So at the university level, yes, it's acknowledged, it's there, uh, it's very much promoted uh, and respected. Uh, in China, I would assume it's a different story. Just again, based on literature and readings, we spent our time in Hong Kong with uh, colleagues from Macau. Uh, there is a lot of emphasis on commercialization, if you will, uh, when it comes to talk about China, Macau, money talks all the time. Uh, sometimes warning uh, of visiting certain places, but go to these uh, places and not that. Uh, we had a chance to go to a place uh, in Hong Kong called uh, Ladies Market, if you remember. And you can see the, um, the gap between those who have and those who have not just moving from the area where we resided during our time, taking the subway, going to the other side of the city, and it was very clear the socioeconomic gap and backgrounds, even in Hong Kong itself. So again, to what extent the discourse that is circulated and strongly maintained on campus, you know, inside the fence of the university, is really promoted and echoed uh, in the society, whether in Hong Kong or in China the mainland as they, as they call it there. So I hope I addressed you in these questions. For the student, I mean, what, what is happening here is demonstrating again how little we know about our world and yeah. how we need to be continuous students. 
And for students, it's illustrating for you the continuous professional development. It does not stop with a degree because there is so much to learn. It starts with a degree. So what you're doing in the classrooms is only uh, one step. And really, uh, the comparative edge constantly in terms of what's happening there, what's happening here, has been at the heart of the school. The other thing is that uh, the school committed itself to comparative education, so it's putting its resources in comparative and international education for students and for faculty. And I think it's really important to put your priorities and uh, move forward. Really, this, is, uh, this has been very uh, fruitful, uh, uh, helpful. I'm sure the students will and the faculty will continue conversations. It would be great one day when we have collaboration. I, I was sit sitting there thinking, imagine if every graduate student goes to an international program but also has a service component in a very marginalized group yes. of schools in Egypt or in a school in Egypt. That this should be one of the requirements of service that while you get your education, go to a, an a MOE school, a rural school or whatever, and spend some time during the two years and reflect on it in terms of it being. So by, by looking at other models, it opens the floor for considering uh, all kinds of alternatives. Uh, we have the room for another half hour. You can have some refreshments, talk, but thank you, Jennifer and Nagwa, very much for your presentation. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. There's a lot to talk about. If you want.